with any developer tool. We don't simply want to turn it on without taking a moment to ensure the right people have the right access to the right features. We need to track licenses, obtain usage reports, and that's just to name a couple of tasks. Let's explore governance for GitHub Copilot to help your organization scale the right way. We're joined today by Luis. Luis, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me, Christopher. Let's start with probably the most basic question, which is we've decided to go with GitHub Copilot. How do I now give my developers access to the tool? This is a really good question that we normally get from our customers. And I think we have to base it on what are your priorities? So I'm going to talk about four common methods that we have that allow you to assign GitHub Copilot licenses. So the first one is a manual way, which basically you can go to your organization settings. For example, if you have a small group of developers, that you're going to do a POC with, you can select each of them individually and assign them a GitHub Copilot license. The second method would be organization-based, where you can go to the organization settings and you can actually assign Copilot licenses across the whole organization. This is another simple way of doing it, but it does come with a little bit of inefficiency because maybe not all your users in that organization are going to use GitHub Ooh. Copilot. The next two are, are my personal favorites. We have an option to do identity provider provisioning, where you can have a GitHub organization linked to your identity provider group. And that way you can say, hey, anyone in this GitHub team that is synchronized with my identity provider group should receive a license from Copilot. This option allows you to do GitHub Copilot rollout at scale and gives you the flexibility to manage all the provisioning externally within your identity system. Right, using the tools then that you've already been using for, for other features and for other enablement. Yes, exactly. And then the last but not least, we have an API uh, for Copilot that you can use to add or remove seats from your subscription. This gives you a lot of flexibility because you can use other parts of the platform to build a really customizable process. For example, you can use GitHub Actions to build a workflow and where a user can go to a repository, create an issue, request a license, and a GitHub action will automatically kick off and provide him the, the right access. So this gives you a really good way of providing a self-serve option to your developers. And you can get really creative with it in, in terms of like, Maybe you have managers assigning to specific teams, or you just provide access to specific engineers, right? So I'm really hearing four ways, and it, it is based on what it is that you're trying to do there. So there isn't necessarily like a one size fits all. The next question then becomes, OK, so I've turned on n number of licenses. How do I make sure that my developers are using those? And how can I also see how they're using those licenses? I like to say to my customers, we have an API for that. So we have two APIs that I want to talk about. When in doubt, there's an API. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have two APIs that I want to talk about. So the first one is the Copilot Metrics API, which will provide you information for the last 28 days of usage across all your licenses. And will give you access to a breakdown by language being used with the Copilot extension. IDE, and even provide you the insights at the enterprise, organization, and team level. So that will allow you to identify which teams or organization maybe need a little bit more of enablement, or maybe uh, it's an opportunity to send them another email to notify them that now they have the tool and they can start using it. Now, the second API is the Copilot User Management API. This one allows you to, to get information about your license allocation. It will give you information about the last day of activity of that seat. It will tell you what was the last uh, editor that was used. And with this one, you could essentially identify a list of licenses that are not being used. But in this case, what I've seen is that you want to have a really defined criteria of what does it mean for a license to not be used within my organization. Uh, a few good ones are, has this developer been able to attend um, internal enablement session? Has this developer been able to install the extension? Have we sent an email notifying them about the new, the new tools they have available? And if after all of this, 90 days or 60 days has passed and there's still no activity, well, that's an opportunity for us to go in and identify and collect feedback. What is the use cases that they need help with? Is it 
uh, they need a little bit more training on how to use each of the options that we have provided, or they have really specific use cases that could be addressed and just need a little bit more engagement from a champion within the organization to show them the way. That's something really interesting that, that, that I heard you say, I think in really kind of two different ways. You know, number one, you highlighted when it comes to acceptance rates, and you can break that down by IDE, you can break that down also by language. When I'm thinking about a license maybe that isn't being used, that could be one way is that the developer isn't quite seeing what they were expecting. And maybe it is that they just need like a little bit of extra training or you need to maybe take another approach of like, oh, okay, well, we need to prompt this way or maybe we need to start taking advantage of instructions or prompt files or some of the other features. And so what I'm really hearing is rather than defaulting to, hey, we're going to remove the license, it's let's figure out why they're not getting the most out of it, or let's figure out why they're not using the license rather than just simply turning it off. Yeah, yeah. Now, how about feature enablement? Because obviously Copilot isn't just code completion anymore, and that's of course not to, to downplay code completion, it's still like near science fiction, but there's an awful lot that goes into GitHub Copilot. So what's a strategy, what's an approach for enabling features? In terms of enabling the features, I would First, have the out of the box, which is autocomplete and GitHub Copilot chat, and then pair it with a one on one session, right? Mm. So, the first group of developers that is going to go to their getting started session should have the out of the box experience. So, that way they can get comfortable with their new developer workflow using AI. So, like how autocomplete changes your experience in the, in the editor where you're coding, and then how you're using the the chat window, and then switching between two and knowing when to decide which surface is the best for the use case that I want to do. Once the developers get familiar and comfortable with that, and they're like way more productive now because they have the, the assistant of Copilot, you can start doing a more advanced session, which is like a 201, where you can start talking about best practices for prompt crafting. You can talk about other additional features within the chat, like variable commands or like agents. But as you said, there's so many to, there's so many features to use and like, there's so much value in it that it's best to have a face approach and introduce each of these features in an iterative way to our developers so they can get comfortable and get the and get the most out of the tools that they have enabled. So this might be a little bit of a funny analogy, but it sounds a little bit like working with a game where we should start with the base game and the base mechanics before we start adding on DLCs. So what's one big thing that you think that organizations and developers really need to keep in mind when we're talking about GitHub Copilot? Hello? Oh wow, it's Andrew Weiss. Let me put you on speakerphone. With GitHub Copilot, it's really very much about an aid to your software development workflows. It's all about using Copilot to accelerate any sort of modernization initiative, establish governance framework, and really help to streamline your development operations. The way in which we see Copilot being used day to day is very much to assist in all sorts of software development activity, not just writing code, but reviewing code, maintaining existing code, and modernizing legacy code. All of the knowledge gaps that we have in place in software development ecosystems today, uh, being able to address those knowledge gaps, better document our code, and ultimately accelerate any sort of software development effort is really the goal for GitHub Copilot and ultimately AI as a whole in our world. So the developer's still in charge then? Absolutely. Uh, the developer has still the end all be all say in all sorts of software development activity. At the end of the day, the developer is still responsible for reviewing all the code that's merged into their software development pipeline, uh, ensuring that it meets all of the security standards and governance frameworks that are in place. And ultimately seeing that software all the way from ideation into production deployments, Copilot is really just an aid at the end of the day to streamline that process. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, Andrew. Let's close on this. One of the most common questions that I get asked is about IP intellectual property and about privacy. What can you share in that regard when it comes to GitHub Copilot? Our customers normally have to navigate these types of conversations internally when they're adopting AI tooling within their organizations. So we have a wonderful website called the GitHub Trust Center, which will provide you all the answers to these type of topics. Beautiful. Thank you so very much for being here today, Luis. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, one thing that really jumped out to me about today's conversation is really the importance of the developer, that it's still the developer that always is in charge when we're talking about GitHub Copilot. To continue your learning, you can check out the link below, and thank you for joining Beyond the Commit.